You're watching This Week in Louisiana Politics with Fred Childers. Good Sunday morning to you. I'm Fred Childers. Thanks for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Politics on your local election headquarters. Well, a new year means new laws for the Bayou State, and on Tuesday, approximately two dozen new laws officially went on the books in Louisiana. Capitol correspondent Harrison Golden has the new rules. I believe that's probably best that we are in line with every other state in the nation. Now Louisiana will be in line with every state but Oregon, at least when it comes to prosecuting felonies committed in or after 2019. Before a jury can convict a defendant, all 12 jurors will have to agree on a guilty verdict. Previously, only 10 of 12 had to agree. The change comes with widespread support from legislators and voters alike. Once you make people realize that across the spectrum, regardless of affiliation of race, they go, no, 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 no. I don't trust government. And I don't want to make it easier for them to lock me up. Also in the new year, state and local government agencies must have concrete policies for handling sexual harassment complaints, annual prevention training for workers, and yearly public logs tracking those complaints and disciplinary actions. And so we want to make sure that there's action taken and that there's sort of standard expectations in terms of documentation of the complaint and confidence that things are going to be investigated and discipline will happen. Meanwhile, thanks to legislation from a breast cancer survivor, Representative Julie Stokes, health insurance providers must now offer mastectomy patients preventative screenings. Had 3D mammography or um, tomosynthesis been available or that I was told about it at the time, I might have averted that whole thing and caught it before it spread to lymph nodes and um, before it upended my life in some major ways. Then there's another preventative measure now provided under state law. Relatives of nursing home patients will be able to place video monitors in their loved ones' rooms to make sure they're getting good treatment. For your local election headquarters, I'm Harrison Golden. Other state laws now on the books include undergrads at four-year universities being able to use their student IDs to vote in state elections. Plus, the cost to register your vote in Louisiana will cost $9 more. Well, this week we saw lots of confusion over the National Flood Insurance Program and its status during the government shutdown. FEMA originally decided it would not issue new flood insurance policies or renew existing ones that expired during the shutdown. That decision would have left some 40,000 people without insurance. Lawmakers argued that was not necessary. The Trump administration then reversed FEMA's decision to halt the sale of new flood insurance policies during the shutdown. The announcement was met with a huge sigh of relief for anyone looking to buy or sell houses in Louisiana. To have the emotion, um, the energy, the effort, uh, the negotiations that go in, uh, the consultation uh, that's involved to only be told that you can't close now because the uh, FEMA won't write, uh, underwrite a flood policy uh, stops the whole process from moving forward. That's Realtor Jeff Welsh. He says there are around 50 to 60 percent of Baton Rouge area homes that require flood insurance for banks to underwrite a mortgage. So the impact on the housing market would have been widespread. With the new year comes a new chance for hospital patients to shop around for their coverage. Our Harrison Golden explains how Louisiana's medical centers are following a new federal mandate to post their service prices online. While the holiday retail season might be over, that doesn't mean the comparison shopping has to end. In the past, if you said that somebody was going to comparison shop with doctors or hospitals or whatever, you know, that was ridiculous to think about it. But today's world, um, consumers are comparison shopping. In line with a federal law that took hold January 1st, all four major hospital systems in the Baton Rouge area now list online what their treatments and procedures cost. The Better Business Bureau, though, would like to take this moment to uh, caution consumers to understand the ruling as best they can. A lot of different factors. Hospital officials urge that the prices posted are not always accurate, as they don't reflect health insurance co-pays nor deductibles. 
Actual prices could also differ based on how urgently someone may need services. Our Lady That's of the bad. Lake CEO Scott Wester That's telling bad. us in a statement, quote, it's important to recognize that most patients do not pay the rates listed as their specific health care plan coverage determines any out-of-pocket charges. Meanwhile, a spokesperson from Women's Hospital saying in a statement, quote, this new law will cause increased confusion, adding that patients should talk to their insurers to fully understand their financial responsibility. But others contend that the federal law at least removes one layer once hidden. They need to do their homework. That may be sitting down with the hospital, but in the end, it will be calling their carrier, their insurance company, to understand what their charges their, or their fees are actually going to be. In Baton Rouge, for your local election headquarters, I'm Harrison Golden. Well, we've been talking about this for months. It's a new political era in Washington as Democrats officially took control of the House for the first time in eight years this week. Mark Meredith was there as the 116th Congress met for the first time on Thursday. House Democrats say their number one priority is to end the government shutdown. This is a shutdown that stretched on for 13 days now, but Democrats admit they can't do it alone. As the 116th Congress is sworn in, a quarter of the federal government remains shut down. But House Democrats say now that they're in control, we will bring to the floor legislation which will open up government. Democrats say today they'll vote to fund government agencies, but not President Trump's border wall. The White House says without money for the wall, the shutdown will go on. This president ran on and will continue to govern on border security. Yet House Democrats we spoke with say a deal can be reached. We can work this out. We can work out a lot of things. I, I hope we can get together on that. I really hope that some cooler heads will prevail on the Republican side. In the Senate, Republicans are adding to their majority. As of today, the GOP controls 53 seats and Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says he'll use that power to block the House's plan to reopen the government. It isn't comprehensive. It ignores the needs of border security. The White House says it will meet with congressional leaders from both parties on Friday with the discussion focused on ending the shutdown. Vice President Mike Pence will be on hand on Capitol Hill for the swearing in of the newly elected senators. As for President Trump on his public schedule, there were no events scheduled. Reporting in Washington, I'm Mark Meredith. Just before the start of the new year, many federal workers got their last paycheck until the government reopens. Jessica Smith reports that for these workers and the rest of us, the shutdown is about to get real. It's the last payday for 800,000 workers caught in the middle of a partial government shutdown. Friday's paychecks cover the days before the shutdown began. Employees who are furloughed or working without pay don't know when they'll get their next check. Office of Management and Budget Director Mick Mulvaney. When they get paid is, is a function of when the government opens up again. About 420,000 people are working without pay, including members of the Coast Guard, some TSA agents, and some correctional officers. Another 380,000 people have been sent home. It looks like we could be in for a, a very long-term shutdown. Congressman Mark Meadows was one of the lawmakers who encouraged President Trump to stand firm for the border wall. But Democrats like Congressman Jerry Connolly say it's a waste of money. The wall is a symbol for him and his base. It's not a serious proposal to deal with border security. The shutdown's impact reaches beyond the nation's capital. The Office of Personnel Management estimates 85 percent of federal workers, not including the military or postal service, live outside of Washington, D.C. With no deal in sight, the EPA is set to run out of money at midnight. The Smithsonian Museums and the National Zoo will close on January 2nd. And FEMA says it won't issue new federal flood insurance policies or renew expiring ones. We do expect this to go on for a while. President Trump canceled his New Year's plans in Florida and will stay in D.C. through the new year. In Washington, I'm Jessica Smith. In the wake of those last paychecks, some federal employees being forced to work without pay during the shutdown have filed a lawsuit against the federal government. The American Federation of Government Employees says the work without pay requirement violates the Federal Labor Standards Act. The new acting defense secretary, Patrick Shanahan, has a big issue on his plate already. Just how long will it take to withdraw U.S. forces from Syria? Barbara Starr takes a look. The first cabinet meeting. On Patrick Shanahan's first day as acting defense secretary, President Trump focused more on the man he just replaced, now former secretary James Mattis. But what's he done for me? How has he done in Afghanistan? Not too good. 
President Obama fired him, and essentially so did I. Mattis, however, resigned after having his advice ignored by the president, according to sources directly familiar with Mattis's thinking. Now, Shanahan takes on the burden of figuring out Trump's changing rhetoric on pulling 2,000 ground troops from Syria, which the president described as... We're talking about sand and death. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about, you know, vast wealth. We're talking about sand and death. Now, the president insisting he has no specific timetable for pulling troops out. Over a period of time. I never said I'm getting out tomorrow. But in a White House-produced video just last month, Trump was adamant on an immediate troop withdrawal. They're all coming back, and they're coming back now. For his part, Shanahan today remained focused on the White House's message about border security. The threat is real. Uh, the risks are real. We need to control our borders. But commanders say it could take as long as four months to get troops out of Syria safely. He made the decision first and then started looking for uh, things to either back it up or run contrary to what he thought. That's confusing to not only our allies but also our foes, and it's especially confusing for the military people. Coming up next, U.S. Senator John Kennedy gives an update on the government shutdown and more. That's next on your local election headquarters. This is your local election headquarters. Welcome back. We're entering the third week of the federal government shutdown. U.S. Senator John Kennedy sat down with KTAL's Dan Jovic in Shreveport to give an update on the stalemate and a few other recent developments. See this as a metaphor, a border wall, as a metaphor for border security as a whole. Other senators have talked about that. Or do you see it as a, a wall, a physical structure that needs it, to be established? In, in some cases, it is a physical structure. Mm -hmm. Our border with Mexico is 1,900 miles. About 600 miles have a, a wall right. or a barrier. In some cases, you can see through it in existence now. Mm -hmm. We need to repair the wall, if you will, that we have now, and we need to build additional barriers. Mm -hmm. Now, in some places, you don't need a barrier. Right. Uh, you have you have the the, uh, the natural topography right. there. You can use drones and technology, mm -hmm. but. The fact of the matter is that border walls, border fences, border barriers work. Mm -hmm. They're working in Yuma, they're working in El Paso, they're working in San Diego, they're working in Israel with the West Bank, in Israel with Gaza, they're working in India, Malaysia, Bulgaria. I mean, border walls, if you want to stop illegal immigration, no. They work. Well, you spoke about uh, legal immigration, too. Government shutdown is also stymieing that process as well. U.S. courts, uh, who are trying to get people into the United States mm -hmm. legally, they're shut down now, Senator. So it is not only stymieing illegal immigration, or at least the thought of it, but stymieing legal immigration as well, the shutdown. Well, how does that make you feel, knowing that the entire process is, uh, really has a monkey wrench in it right well, now? Well, uh, look, uh, when, when you have to shut down government, because your government leadership can't agree, I say a pox on all of their houses. We're all at fault over this. Mm -hmm. The issue is how do we get gov government back open? Right. And the problem we had, quite frankly, President Trump said, I'm going to stay in, in uh, D.C. over the holidays. Mrs. Pelosi, who's negotiating for our Democratic colleagues, she went to Hawaii right. on a vacation. She just got back. Mm -hmm. And really the ball is in her court. The president has put several different proposals on the table, and so far her position has been no, yeah. no, so, no barrier, no wall, sure. which is ironic and a little bit hypocritical because uh, back in 2006, she supported the Secure Fence Act. Right. She was... She was for the border wall before she was against yeah, it. Yeah, and President Bush was not at that time, too. That's a right. Interesting flip uh, on those coins there. Hey, I want to focus something here locally. Last time you and I talked, uh, Senator, you were still undecided about your run for governor. Yeah. You've made that decision. You've said that you are not going to run for governor. What uh, parlayed into those factors uh, in that uh, decision? It was, look, it was a hard decision. I gave myself a deadline. Um, the deadline was on a Monday. I didn't decide until that Sunday. Yeah. And I can't really quantify, I just decided to trust my gut. I just got to Washington, I'm enjoying being a senator. I just felt like I can do my state more good up there right now than I could from coming back home. Sure. But it was a very hard decision. Yeah. And I was, I, you know, I was honored to be able to 
be in that position. Yeah. Um, it's no secret, I think Governor Edwards, who I consider to be a friend, but I think he's, he's, he's led us in the wrong direction. I hate to cut you short, Senator. I appreciate no you stopping by and having a conversation Good with to be us. back in Shreveport, yeah. Bozier. Happy New Year. Back with more news right after the break. This is your local election headquarters. Welcome back. It was a tumultuous week for President Trump as Democrats took control of the House with Nancy Pelosi returning as Speaker. Just 24 hours before, President Trump was criticized by a high-profile Republican. John Lorenz reports. President Trump not backing down from his demand of $5 billion for the border wall. How long are you willing to keep the government shut down? As long as it takes. I mean, look. I'm prepared. I think the people of the country think I'm right. Democrats just as defiant. Open up the government as we continue to debate what is the best way to secure our border. As this stalemate continues, a high-profile Republican says he has issues with Mr. Trump. It was very much my hope uh, that he would rise to the occasion, rise to the mantle of the office. I don't think he's followed through uh, on that front uh, the way he's followed through on some of his other promises. Senator-elect Mitt Romney, who previously received endorsements from Mr. Trump, wrote an op-ed Tuesday that took a few swipes at the president. The Charlottesville uh, response by the president was something that gave me great concern. Uh, the support for Roy Moore in the Senate race was something I was very, very concerned about. Uh, his uh, attack on the media. The president hoping to bridge a gap with Romney. I just hope he's going to be a team player. Romney did say he agrees with some Trump administration policies, including the border wall. I'm John Lawrence reporting. One person who took issue with Romney's op-ed was RNC Chair Ronna McDaniel. In a statement, she called the comments disappointing and unproductive. McDaniel also happens to be Romney's niece. Well, as we turn the page to 2019, we got our first major player who could challenge President Donald Trump in the 2020 election. Senator Elizabeth Warren says she's forming an exploratory committee ahead of a possible run for president. Morgan Wright has more. We are going to turn Washington back to the people. On the last day of 2018, in this video released on her website and emailed to supporters, Massachusetts Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren took a step toward running for president in 2020. I'm launching an exploratory committee for president. An exploratory committee can raise and spend money on polls, travel, and the like to see if there's interest in a full-fledged presidential campaign. Warren is part of a crowded field of Democrats who have signaled they may challenge President Trump, including Senators Cory Booker of New Jersey, Kamala Harris of California, Kirsten Gillibrand of New York, and Sherrod Brown of Ohio. I we're thinking about it in large part because I, I, I don't I don't think anybody really has been talking about the dignity of work and the value of work. Warren is talking about saving America's middle class from the richest 1%. America's middle class is getting hollowed out and opportunity for too many of our young people is shrinking. In a statement, the Republican National Committee says Warren is an extreme far left obstructionist and total fraud. In a tweet, Senator Warren says she's fighting for every person in America to be able to work hard, play by the same set of rules, and take care of themselves and the people they love. She says she'll make a decision on whether she'll run for president early in the new year. In Washington, Morgan Wright. Up next, we'll have a look at the week ahead on your local election headquarters. This is your local election headquarters. Welcome back. Well, let's take a look at what we can expect in the coming week. Speaking at the Baton Rouge Press Club tomorrow is Governor John Bell Edwards. The governor will talk about highlights from 2018, and he'll give us a peek at his initiatives for 2019, his final year for this term before he has to defend his record in the October primary election. Thank you for joining us for this week in Louisiana politics. I'm Fred Childers. I'll see you next Sunday right here on your local election headquarters.